kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Are you concerned about clinical trial enrollment and representation? We think that this topic is very important and assume that all of you listening to this webinar agree with us by answering yes to this title question. Enrollment and representation are the foundations of well-executed trials. This is the outline of our webinar. I will start by summarizing what is written in our regulatory and guidance materials about demographic representation. Manuel will show us demographic data presented and collected during five years of drug trial snapshots program. And Kavita and Shabdeh will tell us about the actions and initiatives of their respective offices that aim to support diversity in clinical trials. This is FDA's standard disclaimer. What you are about to hear are personal opinions of the speakers. None of us has any conflict or interest to declare. So let's begin with the FDA's regulatory framework for trial diversity. We have to start from the end. What does FDA approve? In short, we will approve the drug, device, or biologic for certain indication, which actually represents the population studied and for whom safety and effectiveness has been established. There are also regulations that allow us to extrapolate efficacy data from one population to the other, but this talk will focus on the mainstream of regulatory actions. So the next question is, who are the people in the trials? And the answer is, it depends. It depends on indication and inclusion exclusion criteria for participation. Trial population may consist of healthy volunteers when drug is approved under animal rule, or a very narrow population with certain stage of the disease, or certain biomarker. The population may be defined by comorbidities, but most likely all of these populations will be a mix of patients defined by their age, ethnic, gender, and racial characteristics. And that is what we will cover in this webinar. We also ask the trials are representative of the future users as described in the drug labeling. But labeling negotiation is too late for the discussion. We would like to know how is sponsor progressing towards the goal from the beginning. Final demographic rule of 1998 requires tabulated report on trial participants in every IND annual report. The summary of all of these annual reports is usually part of the background package for end of phase two meeting and a good starting point in discussing recruitment for phase three trials. Final demographic rule requires tabulation and analysis for demographic subgroups in NDA and BLA submission, and that will inform the labeling. However, there were some questions about the extent to which these regulations were followed. So in 2012, Congress mandated FDA to report on the extent of clinical trial participation and inclusion of safety and efficacy data by demographic subgroups. They also asked how is this information communicated to the public? So what did the report show? It showed that regulatory tools were adequate to answer this question that majority of applications for drugs, biologic, and devices submitted to FDA do include demographic subset analysis by sex, race, and age, and that is that the application mentioned demographic subset in some way. The report also pointed to some areas of lower representation. To help us all do better, FDA published a couple of guidances to explain what is expected from trial population in respect to demographic composition. And here you see some of these guidances in chronological order. A 
about gender, geriatric population, pediatrics, collection and reporting on race and ethnicity. Some are more specific, like draft guidance on older population in cancer trials, or some are part of a disease-specific guidance, like the two you see on COVID-19. More on demographic expectations in vaccine and trials for COVID-19, you will hear from Kavita and Sharde. I will now try to summarize a few of these more generalized guidances. These are the take-home points on gender recommendations from 1993 guidance. This guidance eliminated restrictions for women of childbearing potential from participation in early trials. Because of this exclusion, Phase three trials did not have sufficient information on this population. And as you will see later, sometimes that early data from both genders is critical for redefining drug development. FDA expects enrollment of both genders unless there is a gender-specific disease and in sufficient numbers to provide for analysis of differences in response. The guidance also talks about consideration of hormonal changes in women, particularly when selecting women for pharmacokinetic studies. We need to understand how the drug behaves when interacting with fluctuating hormonal levels in women, whether it's physiological or influenced by hormonal contraceptives. When it comes to race and ethnicity, FDA recommends use of the Office of Management and Budget nomenclature for data collecting and reporting. Furthermore, it recommends that relevant population is represented. This may become an issue in trials carried out globally. International Conference on Harmonization E5 describes how clinical data collected in one region can be used for approval in another region. What you see here is the minimum of race and ethnicity categories that can be used for grouping the patients according to self-determination. In the guidance on collection of race and ethnicity data in clinical trials, you may find some additional categories as well as subgrouping according to the country of origin. Regarding age, we are all aware that older people tend to be sicker and taking few more medications that may interact with the testing drug. So excluding some of them may be a necessity. However, arbitrary cutoff of that population, particularly in pivotal trials, may result in issues with indication. If older people will be future users of the drug in development, that population should be included in phase three in meaningful numbers so that we can properly label the drug use. This should be accompanied with the PK data. On the other side of age spectrum, Pediatric Research Equity Act describes very specific requirements and timelines for pediatric assessment during drug development. If the drug is expected to be used by pediatric and geriatric populations, safety and efficacy findings from the trials in these populations are routinely described in drugs label under Section 8, Use in Specific Populations. And here are recommended groups of patients by age. There is some minor variability in the age cutoff between adolescents and adults among FDA centers. All the population cutoff should be at the age of 65, but even more informative would be to use additional categories for 65 to 74 years and 75 and older. This is particularly the case for oncologic and neurologic drugs since both of these therapeutic areas tend to have diseases that affect all the population. 
Some of that is described, as I mentioned earlier, in the draft guidance, inclusion of older adults in clinical trials for oncology drugs. However, we are aware that even with the best recruitment effort, sometimes it is hard to enroll sufficiently diverse population. So, I want to spend some time on the recently published guidance on enhancing the diversity of clinical trial populations, where we provide additional thinking how to approach this complex issue, namely how to increase enrollment of underrepresented population in clinical trials. One approach may be through less stringent inclusion criteria in phase three, after additional safety information has been collected in earlier trials. For example, excluding population with various degrees of kidney impairment is often justified in phase one and two. But if there is no reason to do that anymore in phase three trials, this exclusion criterion could be revised to allow broader enrollment, particularly of African Americans in this case. Innovative trial design approach is another example. Using an adaptive design with an interim analysis could enable adjustment of future enrollment based on pre-specified criteria regarding the response. Enrichment strategies are usually employed to show effect in targeting an often narrow population. But even then, enrolling participants across the full spectrum of disease could be considered and analyzed as a secondary endpoint. Additional efforts could be made to make it easier for patients to become trial participants. There are ways to overcome time constraints, uh, language barriers, miscommunication, and you will hear more about these from Chardet a little later. For patients who cannot make inclusion criteria, expanded access could be considered. This guidance also talks about pregnant women in trials, but I will leave this topic to Kavita a little later. Diversity in the trial matters because of the improvements that can be made. Here are a couple of examples where that diversity influenced regulatory thinking and actions. Sometimes that happens in the pre-approval phase. This is an example of the drug allocitron for the treatment of irritable bowel syndrome and gender differences. An early discovery of lower efficacy rates in men coupled with lower drug availability from PK studies resulted in indication change and the drug was approved only for women. This is another example involving heart failure drug and racial differences. In two trials of racially mixed population, there was notable difference in efficacy of the drug measured by survival between overall population and blacks. In the confirmatory trial, the drug was studied only in blacks and consequently approved for that race only. The post-approval finding on carbamazepine and rare but serious dermatologic adverse reactions Stephen Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis were found to correlate with HLA-B1502 allele. This correlation was much stronger in South Asian patients than in any other racial or ethnic group. And the box warning currently recommends screening for the presence of HLA-B1502 allele in at-risk populations, Asians. Demographics matter for labeling purpose. Prescribing information, section A, has subsections describing use of drug in pregnancy, lactation, the effect of drug on female and male reproductive potential, use of a drug in pediatrics and geriatrics. So to summarize, we encourage and support diversity but we also report on trial demographics in various ways. 
And here is the summary of what and where can be found in regards to demographic data following FDA's approval. The most comprehensive, but also very technical and lengthy presentation and analysis are in the FDA reviews. All are publicly available at Drugs at FDA. Snapshots on the other side contain the most consumer-friendly information, but are limited to new molecular entities and mostly phase three data, while prescribers' information are somewhere in between these two. I hope that this regulatory overview will be a good introduction for the presentations to follow. But before we proceed as required, a little check on what we have learned so far. So please answer with true or false. Final demographic rule describes which demographic subgroups are expected to participate in the trials. True or false. The correct answer is false. Demographic rule requires tabulation and analysis of demographic data in the submissions. I hope all of you got this right, and I want to thank you for your attention. I will conclude my presentation with a quote from my favorite contemporary philosopher, Yogi Berra. You can observe a lot by just watching. And to tell us more about data observations, I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Melvin Okeke. Melvin? Thank you, Milena, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Melvin Okeke, and today I will be presenting new insight regarding the diversity in clinical trials from a drug trial snapshots perspective. I'll begin by giving you a brief background on drug trial snapshots, then I'll go ahead and transition into the data that we collected over the past five years, uh, which was just recently made public and can be accessed by visiting our website, which we'll go over in a few moments. Just so you're aware, I may refer to drug trial snapshots as DTS, so I just wanted you to be mindful of that moving forward. So throughout the past five years, DTS has focused on providing web-based information regarding the participation in clinical trials that supported the FDA approval of new drugs. Specifically, DTS only reports information on new molecular entities and original biologics. Each indication of the drug is referred to as a snapshot and each snapshot typically includes information on trial demographics, trial design, and overall and subgroup assessments of safety and efficacy. In a couple of slides, we'll actually see an example of a snapshot and walk through a couple key sections. So all snapshots are listed on a DTS website, which you can access by visiting the link listed below. Once you open the link, it will bring you to the screen and on this page, you'll find all the snapshots that have, ever, uh, that have ever been reported, along with a few important details regarding each drug, some of which include the active ingredient for the drug, the date the drug was approved, what the drug was approved for, and the prescribing information for the drug. If you'd like to view more details regarding a specific drug, you can go ahead and click the name of the drug, and that, that will take you directly to the snapshot. So this is what a typical snapshot looks like. Towards the beginning of the page, you'll find a brief summary of the drug, which looks like the picture on my left. This summary includes information on what the drug is used for, how the drug is administered, the benefits of the drug, and any adverse events or side effects of the drug. If you scroll further down the page, you see information regarding the clinical trial design and trial demographics that were pivotal to the approval of the drug. And that looks like the picture on my right. So using the information reported from each snapshot that was approved during the calendar year, an annual report is generated. This report summarizes the demographic data for all clinical trial participants. Here you can see an example of the most recent report that was published. Within this report, you will find an average demographic breakdown for all drugs that were approved in 2019. You'll also find an individual breakdown for each drug that was approved 
And lastly, we do also provide a demographic breakdown per therapeutic area. If you're interested in seeing previous annual reports, you can find them all on the Snapshots website. So that was a brief overview of all the publications listed on our website. We will now transition and discuss some of the cumulative data that we collected from trial participants over the past five years. We'll begin by looking at the geographic distribution of clinical trial participants and see how that's changed over time. Then we'll go ahead and take a look at the overall distribution within demographic subgroups and see how that's changed with location and time. And lastly, we'll conclude with looking at the diversity within therapeutic areas. So here we have a map that shows where trial participants come from. We reviewed data for almost 300,000 clinical trial participants from 231 snapshots that were produced between 2015 and 2019. In red, we have participants from the United States. In blue, we have participants from the rest of the world. And the gray areas represent areas of no participation. As you can see, our clinical trial participants come from different areas across the globe and from nearly every continent. Foreign participants happen to make up the majority of clinical trial participants, coming in at 65%. And domestically, we had 35% of participants come from the US. So despite the fact that the majority of participants come from outside of the United States, when we look at trial participants per country, we see that the United States has the highest proportion of participants compared to any other single country. This is then followed by Poland, Germany, and Russia. When we look at clinical trial participation between the US and the rest of the world over time, we do notice a trend. Here we see the difference in trial participation between the US and the rest of the world reduced over time. Despite having a, a consistent higher foreign participation, the overall trend for both groups are fairly similar with some slight variability in 2018 and 2019. Now we'll briefly shift our focus to, to the United States. This map shows the distribution of participants based on the states they enrolled in for their clinical trials. When looking only at the United States, as expected, the numbers for participation varied state by state. The majority of participants enrolled in sites located along the coastal regions and southern states, with California, Florida, and Texas having the highest numbers of participants enrolled. In addition to the coastal regions, we have participants from Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. We will now begin to take a look at the overall demographic subgroup data, starting with the sex distribution for all participants. If you look at the global sex distribution donut chart at the top, you see that females made up 51% of trial participants within the last five years. This is even more so the case in trials conducted uh, exclusively in the United States, where females make up 56% of the trial population. An overall trend presented in the figure to the right shows steady increase in women participation since 2016. So when we look at the global distribution for race, uh, we see that the majority of participants are white. 11% of participants were Asian, 7% were African American, 1% were American Indian or Alaskan Native, and lastly, 5% were categorized as other, which is just a combination of participants that either reported being Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, or they reported their race as unknown, unreported, or missing, or something simply outside of the races that I just previously mentioned. So when we compare the race distribution between the US and the rest of the world, we do notice two key things. Uh, we notice the majority of Asians come from outside of the United States, and the majority of African Americans come from within the United States. If you look at the picture on the left, you will notice that within the United States, we had 2% of our participants report being Asian, and 16% of participants report being African American. However, among foreign participants, we observed the opposite. <laughs> We observed that 16% of participants report being uh, Asian and 2% reported being African-American within the foreign uh, participants. 
when we look at race distribution over time on the right we notice the overall consistent reporting of race categories since 2016 however there is a little bit more variability among the white subgroup so despite having an overall consistent reporting of race we notice there's a slight difference in the location of site enrollment between race subgroups here we have a map showing the U.S. distribution of enrollment numbers and their location for the white subgroup, which is displayed in orange, as well as the minority subgroup, subgroup, which is displayed in blue. The minority subgroup includes all participants that identified as Asian, African American, or American Indian or Alaska Native. What we notice is that the enrollment for the white subgroup is pretty much spread out across the United States having higher numbers in, in major cities. Specifically, we see high numbers in cities like San Diego, Houston, and Miami. On the other hand, minority participants are more spread out uh, in the southern and coastal regions, uh, where we see higher numbers of minorities, and in some cases, a greater proportion than the white subgroup in cities located within Georgia, uh, Arkansas, and the Carolinas. So when we look at the global age distribution, we notice that the majority of participants were younger than 65 years old, and this does include the pedi pediatric population. This distribution is apparent in the United States as it is in the rest of the world. However, the United States seems to have a slightly younger population compared to foreign participants. When we looked at age distribution over time, we noticed that the trend was pretty similar across the two age categories. So moving on to ethnicity, the global numbers for ethnicity show that at a minimum, 13% of participants identified as Hispanic or Latino. Notably for 20% of participants, the ethnicity was missing or was simply not reported. When we look at the differences between the US and the rest of the world, it seems that the US has better reporting of ethnicity. Within the US, 9% of participants reported having missing data for ethnicity, while on the other hand, 26% of foreign participants reported having missing data for ethnicity. When we look at reports of ethnicity over time, we see that the numbers for, uh, for Hispanic and Latino, uh, which is reported in orange, remain pretty consistent over time. On the other hand, the numbers for missing reports of ethnicity, which is presented in red, uh, reduced over time. Okay, so we'll now pivot and quickly take a look at the demographic subgroup data for drugs that were approved specifically for rare diseases. For the most part, the demographics for the rare disease population is pretty similar to the overall clinical trial population. However, there are a few things to make note of. In total, we had over 34,000 participants involved in trials regarding rare diseases. Despite the relatively low number of trial participants, Drugs for rare diseases accounted for over 40% of the drugs approved in the last five years. Of these trials, the majority of participants were male, unlike what we observed in the overall clinical trial population where females were the majority. In addition, we also do see a slightly higher proportion of African Americans, as well as participants that were categorized as other. Lastly, we observed a 7% increase uh, in participants that were less than 65 years old and a 7% decrease in participants that identified as Hispanic or Latino. So moving on, we'll now take a look at the diversity within therapeutic areas. This figure displays the number of participants that enrolled in trials within each therapeutic area. Here we observe that clinical trials relating to cardiovascular disease had the most number of participants having almost 60,000 participants in the last five years. This is then followed by endocrinology and oncology. The therapeutic areas that had 10,000 10, participants or less were psychiatry, ophthalmology, anesthesia, and lastly, med medical imaging. Please keep in mind that these numbers do not represent the number of drug approvals. These, these figures only represent uh, the number of participants in each therapeutic area. So when we subset the therapeutic areas by sex, we notice that trials relating to cardiovascular disease, infectious diseases, and dermatology were majority males, just to name a few. 
whereas trials relating to neurology, pulmonology, gastroenterology, and ophthalmology were primarily females. Lastly, when we subset the therapeutic areas by race, we see that the majority of participants within each therapeutic area were white. However, among the minority race subgroups, Asians, which are presented in red, have the greatest number of participants in most of the therapeutic areas. On the other hand, we observe that African Americans, which are presented in green, have the greatest number of minority participants within infectious diseases, gastroenterology, psychiatry, and ophthalmology. Notably, psychiatry and infectious diseases have the highest proportion of African Americans, having 27% African Americans in psychiatry and 16% in infectious diseases. Okay, let's uh, take a moment to answer this challenge question. Which states within the U.S. had the highest numbers of participants enrolled? Is it A, New York, Texas, Florida? B, California, New York, Texas? C, Texas, California, Florida? Or D, Texas, California, Georgia? I'll give you a few seconds to think about the correct answer. Okay, and the answer is C, Texas, California, and Florida. In closing, we discussed a few key observations regarding the diversity of clinical trial participants within the last five years. Today, we learned that our clinical trial participants are characterized with having a predominantly younger white population from different areas across the globe. In addition, we highlighted the need to report race and ethnicity better in light of the relatively high proportion of unreported and missing race and ethnicity data. We also observed some therapeutic areas with equitable distribution. However, it is apparent that some areas could use some improvement. If you're interested in learning more about the data we've collected over the past five years, please visit the Drug Trial Snapshots website to view the full five-year summary report also, please feel free to jot down any questions you may have, and we can discuss them during the Q&A section. We hope that seeing this data will be a testament of the progress we've made over the last five years and serve as a starting point for further discussion about what can be done better. And with that being said, it's my pleasure to introduce Kavita, who will talk more about what the FDA is doing in regards to women's studies. Thank you. Thank you. It is a pleasure for me to be here with you today. My name is Kavita Desish, and I'm the Associate Commissioner for Women's Health and Director of FDA's Office of Women's Health. FDA's Office of Women's Health was established by congressional mandate in 1994 in the Office of the Commissioner. The mission of the office is to promote the inclusion of women in clinical trials and the implementation of guidelines concerning the representation of women in clinical trials and the completion of sex and gender analysis to identify and monitor the progress of cross-cutting and multidisciplinary women's health initiatives, including changing needs, areas that require study, and new challenges to the health of women as they relate to FDA's mission, and to serve as the principal advisor to the commissioner and other key agency officials on scientific, ethical, and policy issues relating to women's health. We play an active role in leading initiatives to support FDA's public health and regulatory mission. We do this by working in three key areas, science, education, and engagement, which includes our outreach and communication efforts. I will touch base on each of these key areas during my talk. The work of our office is guided by the foundational principle that sex is a biological variable and should be factored into research design, analysis, reporting, and education. Sex and gender are distinct terms. Sex is a biologic construct and is the classification of living things generally as male or female or according to the reproductive organs and functions assigned by the chromosomal complement. Gender is defined as a person's self-representation or how that person is responded to by social institutions 
on the basis of the individual's gender presentation. Since our inception, we have worked across several FDA offices and centers to support research studies on a broad range of topics, including the examination of sex and gender differences. A few years ago, we published FDA's Women's Health Research Roadmap, a first of its kind. The roadmap incorporated cross-agency input to create strategic direction by outlining priority areas to help maximize the impact of our research initiatives and ultimately promote optimal health for women. The Office of Women's Health Research Roadmap outlines seven broad priority research areas. Topic areas include advancing safety and efficacy of FDA regulated products, improving clinical study design and analysis, evaluating new modeling and simulation approaches, advancing biomarker science, expanding data sources and analysis, improving health communications, and identifying sex differences via emerging technologies. Findings from our funded research have informed FDA product labeling, contributed to safety information, and informed guidance for industry. One part of our mission is to monitor and advocate for the participation of women in clinical trials. We worked with the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research and conducted a decadal review evaluating the participation of women in cardiovascular clinical trials submitted to FDA in support of several therapeutic marketing applications over a 10-year period. This represented approximately 36 drug approvals. Results of our study showed that participation of women approached disease prevalence for conditions such as hypertension and atrial fibrillation, but was below disease prevalence for conditions such as heart failure, coronary artery disease, and acute coronary syndrome. Other results demonstrated that screening did not exclude nearly enough patients to account for the differences in participation that were observed. Based on our limited data, study inclusion and exclusion criteria appear to exert relatively minor effects on women's participation. Minimal gender differences in drug efficacy and safety profiles were observed. Our study suggests that pre-screening factors may contribute more to low enrollment numbers, such as identification of potential trial participants. Future research is needed to identify the factors leading to underrepresentation of women in certain clinical trials. Another priority area for our office is to provide professional training and education. To support this mission, we created a quarterly scientific speaker series, which aims to bring in world-renowned experts to share the latest discoveries in sex and gender science with our FDA staff and federal partners. These lectures focus on timely and critical topics. For example, this year we hosted a seminar on sex differences and the impact on vaccine efficacy and recently we hosted a seminar on sex differences in COVID-19 and COVID-19 and pregnancy. Each year we host a scientific conference focused on a critical or emerging public health issue. Two years ago, we planned a two-day conference on the influences of sex and gender on opioid and nicotine use, dependence, and recovery. In 2019, we hosted a meeting on the safety of asthma medications in pregnancy. And just last month, we held a multidisciplinary scientific conference on CBD and other cannabinoids. This meeting highlighted the existing research on sex and gender differences in use and responses, as well as the knowledge gaps that exist. We also develop educational programming through collaborations with our federal partners. Bench to Bedside, Integrating Sex and Gender to Improve Human Health is a series of webinars developed in partnership with NIH's Office of Research on Women's Health. These self-paced webinars aim to help researchers and clinicians explore sex and gender differences that impact health, disease, and treatment in key disease areas. Topics for, this, for these webinars include immunology, cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease, neurology, endocrinology, and mental health. The course is free 
and you can find the course landing page on the bottom of this slide. To further support our mission to promote the inclusion of women in clinical trials, we developed a campaign called the Diverse Women in Clinical Trials Campaign. This was developed in collaboration with NIH's Office of Research on Women's Health to raise awareness about diverse women of different ages, races, ethnic backgrounds, and health conditions participating in clinical trials, and to share best practices about clinical research design, recruiting, and data analyses. The campaign includes a consumer awareness component, as well as resources and workshops for health professionals and researchers. For example, on this slide, you will see a fact sheet developed as part of this initiative, highlighting 15 things you should know before you join a clinical trial. This includes a list of questions that a potential trial participant can ask to begin the conversation around participating in a trial. In addition, we have created a social media toolkit, which includes sample social media resources that can be used to inform consumers and health professionals about the Diverse Women in Clinical Trials campaign to further promote participation of women in clinical trials. Maternal health is also a very important focus area for FDA and for our office. We serve as the member on the task force on research specific to pregnant and lactating women, also known as PREGLAC. The 21st Century Cures Act established the task force to advise on gaps in knowledge and research on safe and effective therapies for pregnant women and lactating women. The PREGLAC task force developed 15 recommendations and recently published a report of implementation recommendations. This was a collaborative effort across FDA and with external federal and non-federal partners. In addition, FDA has also published draft guidance on topics including scientific and ethical considerations for inclusion of pregnant women in clinical trials, post-approval safety studies, and considerations for study design of clinical lactation studies. Recently, FDA published guidance on COVID-19, developing drugs and biological products for treatment or prevention. FDA encourages the enrollment of pregnant and lactating individuals in phase three efficacy clinical trials, if appropriate. In addition, the guidance for industry, development and licensure of vaccines to prevent COVID-19 states that FDA encourages vaccine developers to consider early in their development programs data that might support inclusion of pregnant women and women of childbearing potential who are not actively avoiding pregnancy in pre-licensure clinical trials. It's important that we explore strategies to help us learn more about the effects of medications in pregnancy. Our office maintains a website that lists pregnancy exposure registries, which are studies that collect health information from women who take prescription medications or vaccines when they are pregnant. We maintain this website because it is a valuable resource to inform pregnant women and their healthcare providers of potential research opportunities. Enrolling in a pregnancy exposure registry can help inform safety information for medicines used during pregnancy and can be used to update the medication's labeling. We utilize multiple strategies to talk to women about medicines and pregnancy and to also alert them to opportunities to participate in research. Here's an example of our social media posts for the pregnancy exposure registries and for our Diverse Women in Clinical Trials campaign. We have made progress in women's participation in clinical trials in many areas. However, to continue with this momentum, the Office of Women's Health recently put out a federal register notice seeking input from our stakeholders on ways to further direct outreach to diverse groups of women to encourage participation in clinical trials, promote access to relevant information about FDA regulated products, and to maintain a dialogue about critical women's health topics. Recently, we launched our new initiative called Knowledge and News on Women's Health, also referred to as our NO initiative. Launched in February of 2020, 
This initiative is designed to educate and share important women's health information. For American Heart Month, we released the Getting a Beat on What Women Know About Heart Health video. This is to raise awareness among women about heart disease risk factors, prevention tips, and signs and symptoms that may present differently in women. We also recently created a blog called our Knowledge and News on Women blog, which covers important women's health topics. We offer easy to read free publications on a variety of health topics. This can be downloaded or free copies can be ordered for over 40 fact sheets and brochures in English and Spanish. And we also offer toolkits and videos and many of our publications are also translated in other languages. I invite you to stay connected with us. You can follow us on Twitter or Facebook or sign up for our monthly newsletter, which is the OWHE update. I'm going to conclude with a challenge question. Which of the following statements about sex and gender is correct? A, sex is a biological variable. B, the terms male and female are used to characterize gender. C, gender is a binary variable. And D, sex and gender are synonymous. The answer is A, sex is a biological variable. Thank you again. It's a pleasure to be here with you today to provide information about the FDA Office of Minority Health and Health Equity and the work that we are doing to advance diverse participation in clinical trials. I'm Rear Admiral Sharde Arojo, the Associate Commissioner for Minority Health and Director of the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity at FDA. Today I'm going to provide an overview of the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity and the work that we do I'll describe our diversity and clinical trials initiative, as well as provide an overview of communication and outreach strategies to advance diverse participation in clinical trials. In 2010, the FDA established the Office of Minority Health. And in 2019, we were renamed to the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. We are very excited about our new name. We think it really helps to highlight the scope of the work that our office has historically performed and what we will continue to do which is working to protect and promote the health of racial and ethnic minority, underrepresented and underserved populations by focusing our work on research and outreach and communication that works towards addressing health disparities. Our office sits within the office of the commissioner. We work broadly across the agency, as well as with both public and private sector stakeholders. And we have three overarching goals. We aim to improve regulatory science by increasing data available on the populations that we serve, we aim to strengthen FDA's ability to respond to minority health concerns and promote health and safety communication to populations that often experience low health literacy, speak English as a second language, or not at all. As I mentioned, we focus our work in two key areas. Our research and collaboration program aims to advance minority health and health equity focused research. And we do this by supporting both intramural as well as extramural research, we participate in research opportunities across our agency, including the FDA Centers of Excellence in Regulatory Science and Innovation, or CIRCE, and these are collaborations between FDA and certain academic institutions. We also work to continue to provide training in the space of health disparities, and we do this through supporting both internships and fellowships. And of course, we engage broadly with our stakeholders so that we can continue to get input into our research agenda. Our outreach and communication program aims to improve FDA's communications with the populations that we serve through developing a variety of different culturally and linguistically competent programs, initiatives, and campaigns. One of these is our diversity and clinical trials initiative. And this is one of our most notable and long-term initiatives that is really central to our core mission of the office. And I'll spend some time talking more about this initiative in just a moment. We also have a language access program where we work to ensure that across all of the tools and resources and other materials that we develop, that they are provided in multiple languages. We develop health education materials on diseases and conditions that disproportionately impact minority populations. We engage in social media outreach. We have a newsletter. 
We also have a dedicated web page that houses all of the information that I'll be highlighting today. And another area for us that's really important is our health equity lecture series. And through our health equity lecture series, we provide webinars and it provides an opportunity for us to bring experts on minority health and health equity to share their information and the work that they are doing, not only with FDA, but also with the public. All of our webinars are freely available and previously recorded webinars can be found on our website. And lastly, the other area that I think is really important to highlight, um, especially when you're working in the space of health disparities, we know that collaborations and partnerships are critically important. So across all of our programmatic areas, we are always working to foster collaboration between FDA and our stakeholders. We know that more than 65 million Americans speak a language other than English at home. And through our language access program, we aim to provide access to translation services for our FDA centers and offices so that we can provide easy to read materials in other languages. And we also oversee a volunteers program. And this program includes FDA staff that are native speakers in multiple different languages that help us to review translated materials for accuracy. As I mentioned, our office was established in 2010. So this year we celebrated our 10 year anniversary and we highlighted the work that our office has accomplished over the past decade in an FDA Voices blog, as well as in an article in the Journal of the National Medical Association. Another area that's very important for us is that we continue to get stakeholder input into our strategic priorities moving forward. And we were able to do this by opening a public docket through a federal register notice so that we could solicit input and comments from stakeholders on the strategic priorities for our office so that we can make sure that important health concerns are carefully considered as we establish our priorities. And we are actively reviewing the comments that we received. And of course, a key priority area for our office is working to advance diverse participation in clinical trials. We know that racial and ethnic minorities have been and continue to be underrepresented in clinical trials. And clinical trials are very important because they provide a crucial base of evidence for evaluating whether a medical product is safe and effective. And enrollment in trials should reflect the diversity of the population that is ultimately going to use the product. We know that persons of different ages, races, and ethnicities may react differently to certain medical products. So it's important for participants in clinical trials to reflect the diversity of the population that is ultimately going to use the product so that that data can be appropriately analyzed and more meaningful information can be communicated to the public. There are many reasons why minorities have been underrepresented in clinical trials. And one of the barriers that we know all too well is the lack of trust due to past historical abuses. Other barriers to participation may be based on the population that you're seeking to enroll and may include language and cultural differences, religion, or a simple lack of awareness about what a clinical trial is and what it means to participate. Some barriers may be due to aspects of trial design, such as inadequate recruitment and retention efforts, accessibility to the site location, frequency of study visits. Participation may also conflict with caregiver or family responsibilities and may cause time away from jobs and other commitments. There may also be a perception that minorities do not want to participate and they simply aren't asked. As Milena highlighted, following the 2012 FDA Safety and Innovation Act and the priorities set forth in FDA's action plan of data quality, participation, and transparency, the FDA has hosted public meetings, developed tools to work to overcome some of these barriers, as well as issued guidance documents to support diverse participation in clinical trials. And of course, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have continued to work to raise awareness around the importance and the need for diverse participation in clinical trials. And this was highlighted in two guidance documents, the FDA guidance for industry on development and licensure of vaccines to prevent COVID-19 specifically states that FDA encourages the inclusion of diverse populations in all phases of vaccine clinical development, and that FDA strongly encourages the enrollment of populations most affected by COVID-19, specifically racial and ethnic minorities. The FDA guidance for industry on COVID-19 developing drugs and biological products for treatment or prevention specifically states that racial and ethnic minority persons should be represented in clinical trials. And it goes on to state that sponsors should ensure that clinical trial sites 
include geographic locations with a higher concentration of racial and ethnic minorities to recruit a diverse study population. In support of FDA's efforts to advance diverse participation in clinical trials, the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity developed our Diversity in Clinical Trials initiative. This is an initiative that has been ongoing for a number of years, and it includes a multimedia public education and outreach campaign that works to raise awareness and help address some of the barriers preventing diverse groups from participating in clinical trials through a variety of culturally and linguistically competent strategies, tools, and resources. Some of the motivators for this campaign, of course, are to reinforce and highlight the importance of diverse participation in clinical trials, to educate consumers about key issues related to clinical trial diversity, and to help stimulate dialogue among peers and patient provider communities. As I mentioned, this is an ongoing campaign and we are always working to add new tools and resources. And our campaign consists of educational materials in multiple languages that highlights the value of clinical trial participation, including highlighting what a clinical trial is, what it means to participate, and why it's important for us to have diverse participation. We have public service announcements and videos. We also engage in social media outreach, all of that work towards encouraging different groups to participate in clinical trials. We have ongoing outreach to engage different communities and health professionals. And another area that's really important for us, especially when we think about the barriers to participation in clinical trials and how those barriers cross multiple sectors, it's important for us to have close collaborations with public and private sector stakeholders across government, academia, industry, among others, so that we can continue to raise awareness on the need and the importance of diverse participation in clinical trials. We also have a dedicated webpage that houses all of the tools and resources that I'm highlighting, as well as a communications toolkit that includes already prepared social media messages. This is a snapshot from some of the resources that we have available. We have our podcasts, we have our videos. All of our videos feature a different key theme and message, and we also have our Latinos in Clinical Trials video that's available in Spanish. This is another snapshot from one of the videos that we have available. This is highlighting Shirley's story. And the key message within this video is that diversity is critical to making better medical products. I mentioned that collaborations and partnerships are of course part of our campaign and, and very important. And we had an opportunity to partner with the VA Office of Health Equity. We know that our veterans may face unique health challenges. And we wanted to highlight the importance of veteran participation in clinical trials, as well as minority veteran participation. So we developed three videos featuring three veterans sharing their stories on the importance of diverse participation in clinical research. One of our most recent videos that we developed is focused on medical device clinical trials. It highlights the importance of medical device clinical trials, as well as the importance of diverse participation within those trials. These are some of the resources that I mentioned. We have fact sheets, brochures, as well as a dedicated web page that houses all of the tools and resources that I highlighted today. And I did want to spend a moment just highlighting some of our stakeholder engagement activities. This is not all of our stakeholder engagement activities, but it does provide an idea of some of the ways that we engage to continue to advance diverse participation in clinical trials. We have a memorandum of understanding with the Alliance of Multicultural Physicians, and this is a collective of the five major national minority physician associations. We also have a memorandum of understanding with Yale University so that we can engage with their cultural ambassador program, which is an engagement of community partners to increase diverse participation in clinical research. We also participated in the multi-regional clinical trial center and Harvard diversity work group. And they recently released their achieving diversity, inclusion and equity in clinical research. Um, diversity framework, and they highlighted this in a recent health equity lecture that the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity hosted, and the recording for that lecture can be found on our website. Also, as part of this engagement, the FDA and the MRCT Center also hosted a meeting on heterogeneity of treatment effects in clinical trials, methods, and innovations, and this was held on November 30th and December 1st. We've also engaged with the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative, our City Diversity Project, and City is a public-private partnership co-founded by Duke University and FDA, as well as engaging with the Society for Clinical Research Sites Diversity Awareness Program. 
I've highlighted a number of our outreach and communication efforts, but I did also want to state that research is also very important so that we can, for example, continue to understand how to overcome barriers. And we participate in all of the research opportunities that we have across our agency that I highlighted earlier and that you can see here from CIRCES, intramural as well as extramural research. So in closing, I think it's important for us to remember that there's not a one-size-fits-all approach to overcoming all the barriers to recruiting a diverse study population. Planning early is very important. Consistent and continued and bi-directional community engagement through working with cultural ambassadors, faith-based organizations, and with trusted leaders in the community are all examples of efforts that help to support diversity in clinical trials. It's also important to engage patients in trial design, logistics, and recruitment and retention practices, as well as site locations where there are more racial and ethnic minorities, diverse study team staff, as well as engaging providers. It's also important that we work to eliminate language barriers through translations and interpreters and ensure that our eligibility criteria is not overly burdensome. All of these efforts can continue to help and support advancing diverse participation in clinical trials. I highlighted earlier on that our office develops health education materials on diseases and conditions that disproportionately impact racial and ethnic minorities. I just wanted to take a moment to highlight some of these here, and all of this information can be found on our website. We, of course, also engage in social media outreach and highlight various different important health topics and raising awareness about the information, tools, and resources that we have available at FDA. And now we have a challenge question. One strategy to raise awareness on clinical trial diversity is to develop culturally and linguistically tailored health education materials. True or false? Of course, the response is true. We know that developing culturally and linguistically tailored health education materials developed for diverse audiences is one component to help provide education and raise awareness on clinical trial diversity. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share information with you today on the work that the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity is doing. All of our contact information can be found here and we look forward to connecting with you. Thank you to all of our presenters for those great presentations. If you haven't had a chance to enter your questions into the Q&A chat pod, please do so now. Our first question is directed to Dr. Lalek. You mentioned COVID-19 guidance and expectations for a diverse trial population. Do you have any data from COVID-19 trials to share? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yes, we have one drug so far approved for uh, COVID-19, that's remdesivir. And we recently published the data from the trials. Um, and I think we may have them ready. Could you show the slide? It would be easier to follow. Thank you. Um, so um, there were actually three trials with combined population of uh, about 2,000 hospitalized hospitalized patient. And the breakdown you see here on the left upper core, uh, corner, there was a 63% of men. On the right side, it's a racial distribution with 57% white, 18% black, 14% Asian, and about 1% of both American Indian and Native Hawaiian. Um, a left lower quadrant is the age distribution, about 35% were older uh, than 65 years. And on the right, you have ethnic distribution, Hispanics were represented with 21% uh, of all participants. Thank you for responding to that question. 
The next question is also directed to Dr. Lalek. Do demographics by age, gender, gender etc., need to be reported per dose for dose escalation studies prior to the recommended phase two doses is, is determined? Uh, we are requesting that all the demographics from all development program is captured in annual reports for INDs. These do not necessarily need to be break down by the dose, but for all the participants in, let's say, those ranging trial, we would like to see the cumulative uh, number and distribution per uh, sex, race, ethnicity, and age. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question is also addressed to Dr. Lalek. If you're unable to get target representation in a trial, what happens? Is the trial suspended or do you use the limited population results and note that certain populations were underrepresented? Uh, this is an excellent question. And I just want to um, make it clear that FDA is fully aware that recruitment is a very hard job. Um, I would say I would say the first would be what what you probably already doing, reassess and adjust. And you may want to use some of the tools that Shaden Karita mentioned or, or look for additional sites with a history of better recruitment of the population of your interest. Um, you can always request the feedback from the division where your IND was open about the current demographic breakdown along with um, description of your efforts taken so, so far. Uh, it is also very good to include the rationale why the recruitment population is uh, not as expected. Um, and uh, overall, I think sooner you engage in discussion with your uh, division, the outcome would be better. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question is directed to Mr. Okiki. Do DTSs cover both Rx and OTC human drug trial? Uh, so drug trial snapshots only reports demographic information on new molecular entities and original biologics. We do not report uh, information on over-the-counter drugs. Thank you for responding to that question. And the next question is also directed to Mr. Akiki. For the map that you showed for participants enrolled by state, was that just for an, in a single year? And what year was it? So the map was in regards to uh, years 2015 and 2019. It includes the entire clinical trial population for that time. Um, and all participants. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question is direct to Mr. Okiki. Is the increase in women participation similar across all therapeutic areas? So that's a good question. Um, so the sex distribution across therapeutic areas is fairly consistent to the sex distribution that we saw in the overall clinical trial population. Uh, there were a few trials where uh, we saw an increase in women participation. Uh, some of them include uh, oncology, neurology, um, pulmonology, and gastroenterology. Um, so it's pretty split um, for the most part. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question is directed to Rear Admiral Arojo. What FDA resources are available for an investigative site 
to improve the inclusions of diverse populations. Thank you. That is a very good question. Um, on one of my slides, I did highlight the resources that we have available on clinical trial diversity, and all of these resources are freely available on our website and can be used. They highlight information on what a clinical trial is, what it means to participate, and other important information about participation in research studies. So I encourage you to look at our website. It can be found at www.fda.gov forward slash health equity. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question is directed to Rear Admiral Araujo. There is sometimes a misunderstanding that inclusive research is more important in, a later, in later phase trials. We'd love to hear FDA's perspectives on increasing diversity in early phase studies where the overall N is small. That is an excellent question. Across all of the work that we do, we are communicating about all phases of trials with regard to participation, so both phase three trials as well as all phases. So our research materials do highlight information um, related to all phases of participation. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question is directed to Rear Admiral Araujo. Does OMHHE engage with pharma companies? Our office engages broadly um, with many stakeholders from pharma companies as well as academia, nonprofit organizations, health advocacy organizations. So we engage broadly. One of the areas that um, we really know is important is when we have a multi-sector approach it's important so that we can really work to overcome all of the barriers with regard to clinical trial diversity. Thank you for responding to that question. Our next question is directed to Dr. Lalek. Are sponsors expected to still collect race and ethnicity in countries where this is considered to be sensitive personal information like France and South Uh, yes, we see uh, issues with collecting race and ethnicity uh, outside the United States. Um, and, uh, of course, sponsors need to follow the regulatory practices of the countries in which the site is located. So if this is not um, a category that is allowed to be collected, it is okay not to collect it, but also in the text or under the table that should be noted as not collected per regular, local regulatory authority. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question is directed to Dr. Lalek. Are there plans to incorporate ethnicity, Hispanic versus non-Hispanic, data into DTS? As you probably know, as you probably know, we know that disease burden can sometimes vary significantly by ethnicity. Uh, actually, we do report uh, on uh, composition of the trials, including ethnicity. Uh, you actually saw one of those presentations for Randesavir. Uh, from the start of snapshot, uh, this uh, particular category was not consistently reported, but about three years ago, that has been um, not the case. Um, I do believe that in the future, uh, we will be reporting more consistently on uh, safety and efficacy as well, which at this part is uh, mainly focused on sex, race, and age. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question is directed to Dr. Lalek. 
are there plans to include DTS data from drugs that are not NMEs? For example, drugs under the 505B2 regulatory pathway, new formulations, for example? Uh, we do have um, a lot of requests for broadening the type of the drugs in the snapshots. And as of now, I can tell you that all of these are under considerations, although um, I'm not expecting anything uh, in the imminent future. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question is for Mr. Okiki. For, trial participant, for the trial participant slide, what about Latinos and Hispanics? What is the distribution? Well, that's a good question. Um, I actually mentioned this within my slides. Um, so within the global trial population, we had about 13% of our participants report being Hispanic or Latino. Um, within the U.S. specifically, we had 15% of our uh, participants reported being Hispanic or Latino. And when we looked foreign and to the rest of the world, uh, we had about, um, I believe it was 11% of our participants report being Hispanic or Latino. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question is for also for Mr. Okiki. Is it possible for the public to download DTS data for the U.S. alone in addition to global figures? Uh, so that's a good question. Um, so we're not uh, allowed to share patient level data. Um, however, I can tell you uh, we have a wealth of data and figures on our snapshot website and you can download all of our annual summaries and also this five-year report. Uh, we have a few figures that we did that I didn't mention within my presentation. Um, so you can go ahead and check that out on the snapshots website. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question is for Mr. Okiki. We're curious as why as to why the participation was lower overall in 2016. So I can't really speak on why the participation was lower in uh, 2015, uh, 2016. I'm sorry. Um, however, I can tell you that within 2016, uh, we approved 22 uh, new approved drugs um, and. If you look at 2015, it looks like there's a, a huge jump. But uh, yeah, in 2016, we approved only 22 drugs. But I cannot speak on why uh, participation was lower in 2016. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question is directed to Rear Admiral Araujo. What was the gap? observed that caused the name to include health equity? Thank you for the question. Um, we added health equity to our name to really highlight the work that the office has performed since we were established in 2010. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question is directed to Rear Admiral Arojo. What categories are used for capturing wraiths and ethnicity? As Milena mentioned, we follow the Office of Management and Budget Standards for capturing race and ethnicity. And the other thing that I think is important to highlight is that FDA also recommend, recommends self-reporting of race and ethnicity information and that individuals be able to designate multiracial identity. So as far as the standards that we follow, we do follow the Office of Management and Budget, as Milena highlighted. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question is directed to Rear Admiral Arojo. What is your take on 
the 2015 to 2019 report. As Melina highlighted, when we look at the U.S. participation, for example, from the report and, and looking at Black or African American participation at around 16 percent and, um, for example, Hispanic participation around 15 percent, we see that there are steps being made for us to work to advance uh, diverse participation in clinical trials. But when we look at that data a little bit deeper and really dive into looking at it for particular diseases and conditions, we also see where there are areas where we need to continue to do work as far as advancing racial and ethnic minority participation in clinical trials. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question is directed to Rear Admiral Arojo. Why is community engagement important in advancing clinical trial diversity? When we think about the barriers to participation, community engagement is so important in working to overcome those barriers, to build trust between the community and the organization conducting the research. We often hear that um, for a particular trial, you may step in and engage with a community and then step out, but it's really important to have consistent, continued, and bi-directional community engagement and working with cultural ambassadors and trusted leaders in the community so that you can also understand the gaps and needs for that particular community and um, work to advance participation of the groups that you are intending to recruit in your clinical trials. So it's important to be able to build a trusted and long-lasting relationship that's sustainable. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question is directed to Dr. Lalek. Can we enroll all the patients from the rest of the world outside of the USA for a phase three trial of an NCE, also an NDE, NDA application? As I mentioned, uh, we are expecting the phase three trial population to be the population that will use the drug and be representative of the population in the United States. We do approve drug for United States only. So uh, having the population exclusively from outside the U.S. probably will not check both boxes. Uh, we strongly recommend that at least some portion of the patients are from U.S. sites because you will get better representation. Uh, having said that, um, you remember the map that uh, Melvin showed. Uh, for the last five years, we had about one-third of participants in all the trials from U.S. and two-thirds from outside. Thank you for responding to that question. We have a follow-up question directed to Dr. Lalek. Were these COVID-19 trials in the U.S. Uh, no, uh, I assume this is about remdesivir drug. Um, the trials for remdesivir were actually conducted uh, in about 17 countries around the world and in the United States. Uh, the participation from the United States was uh, 65%. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question is directed to Dr. Lalek. You mentioned in your talk that in 2012, FDA reported a high percentage of submissions that report and analyze the demographics. What happens if these data are not in the submission? Well, we would ask that the tabulation and analysis be submitted before the NDA or BLA filing. And that will come in the form of uh, information request. Uh, there is also guidance that I haven't mentioned before. It, it was uh, published in 1993 
new drug evaluation guidance document, uh, a refusal to file, um, which uh, states that the agency can exercise its uh, refusal to file option under CFR 314. Uh, that is the same one that talks about uh, the composition of NDA. Um, so I think the step number one would be that this data is included in the NDA or BLA submission. Step number two, if it's not, to promptly answer our information request, because without the data, uh, we cannot really assess the safety and efficacy of the drug properly. Thank you for responding to that question. Looks like we have time for just one more question, and that question is directed to Mr. Okiki. Do you happen to notice any differences in the race distribution across sex categories? So I actually didn't include this analysis in my presentation. However, if you go online and view the five-year summary, um, we actually have a figure that shows the race distribution between sex categories. Um, for the most part, uh, the, the race distribution was pretty similar between males and females. Um, I'm sorry, cut off. I'm sorry. Uh, for the most part, the race distribution is fairly similar between male and females. We didn't notice anything significantly different between uh, males and females. Thank you. Thank you to all of our presenters for your very informative and timely talk and also for responding to the questions that came in. A few closing